brand new episode of Box Talks. Thank you for joining in. I'm just going to drop the name straight away before I go into any kind of build up because it's just hard with today's guest. I chat today with uh, Mohit Oberoi. Uh, with a name like that, no, well, the name is okay, but <laughs> given his track record in Indian climbing, how do I contextualize him? Let me try with uh, this book for starters. He's the author of Rock Climbing in and Around Delhi, in my opinion, one of the best climbing guidebooks for any area in India. He has been responsible for a lot of the development and the documentation of the areas around Delhi. He's, uh, and this was in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, he's also done some incredible climbing down south in Savandurga, Ramnagaram, all of these areas. If I have to kind of do a word association game where someone says Indian climbing, then Mohit Oberoi is probably going to be one of the first, if not the very first name to pop up. He is a pillar of Indian climbing. He's also the founder of Adventure 18, uh, which was the country's first adventure goods store. So there's a lot in his cap, so to speak. Today's episode is full of stories, as you could expect with a character like Mo. We talk about how he started climbing, uh, Robert Chambers, who that is, and what his role was in conserving these areas around Delhi. Uh, climbing in the 80s, what was it like? You know, before there were gyms, before climbing shoes were available, all of that. Um, his climbing down south, competing in Tokyo in 1991, Mo was part of the very first team of Indian climbers who competed internationally. It was a competition that had Yuji Hirayama, uh, Didier Rabatou, Fred Nicole, uh, Shibetri Bowen, Eli Shevyu, so many other big names. What was this like back in 91? Training in the 90s, climbing 70 plus in 1994. Yeah, Mo did that uh, among so many other things. What he felt about the split in direction between indoor and outdoor climbers towards the later 90s and early 2000s. Uh, what he feels about the nature of development today and yeah, getting back into climbing after a break because of an injury, what are his views, what is his approach towards the sport today? He's 52. What are his goals? What is he, uh, yeah, what place climbing holds in his life essentially? Yeah, this is a guy who's, yeah, he's got just so many stories. He once uh, made a joke about, I'm not handing out any more stories for free, but I've convinced him to really lay down some good ones today. I promise you this episode is going to be worth your time and a listen and then a second and then a third. So here we go. Box Talks with an absolute legend, Mohit Oberoi. Mo, thanks so much. It's, it's good to see you. Thank you so much, man, for doing, uh, for yeah, wanting to do this interview. Yeah, same here, Dylan. I've been watching uh, box talks, I mean, listening to them actually, and watching them on Instagram. And they're very interesting. Uh, very, uh, yeah, I just initially I want to know what the format is and how people you know, react to these things. And, uh, yeah, it's good. good to see you. Man. And uh, how you been during this lockdown and, well, you know, during this whole pandemic thing? Actually, it's really good, yeah. I've actually had a great time, to be honest. Initial days were, of course, being at home, which was again a good thing. And just being with the family and the boys have been in boarding school, so it was good that they were here. And we could just hang out together, do things together. We have a wall at home and a crack and stuff. And we did some climbing. It was not amazing all the time. But after kind of a lockdown calmed off, I was trying, you know, getting out a lot. No traffic with the bike. I could sneak to my lake and swim there. My lake, I mean, Bharti Lake. And uh, so it's been really good yeah. Good fun. Of course, businesses and all the other things were getting affected. But personally, I think it was a good downtime. You know? I think we all go in. I mean, I was at least. I don't want the others. But, uh, you know, you get into an overdrive to everything. Yeah? So maybe it was a good time to just sit back and just chill. It was kind of the same for me because I kept reading about a lot of people who just had anxiety managing this time at home you know they were like oh i don't know what to do because there's just so much of hyper stimulation and it was actually a really good time to just be you know just calm down you just have less hitting you all the time in terms of whether it's social media or whatever it is less stimulus less pressure to do a lot of things and there was also a good time to just kind of take a look at climbing and figure out what's right what's wrong and uh 
focus on things that just become very easy to ignore when you're climbing all the time, like stretching. I've spent quite a bit of time stretching and it just feels so good on the body. And uh, you know this over the years, how you can just end up ignoring certain aspects and you're just like going hardcore yeah. all the time. Cool. I want to start uh, with, for everyone who doesn't know, uh, just a little bit of background about when and how you started climbing. So uh, I started uh, hiking when I was in fourth grade, must be when I was nine or ten. And if you, in terms of years, it must be 1979, 80. I mean, it just sounds like really back, really back. Like that's all it was. And a uh, little bit of a hike to from Dehradun to Masui. We went through the Delhi Mountain Association. That, I think those trips were really good. And um, and then I went for a climbing course in Nu. Uh, which is a which is a crag which is beyond Hodge. It's another forty kilometers in the loop, and it's beautiful rock. I think it's got affected by quarrying over the years, but that was way back in seventy nine. So I did like a four or five day course, and I really, and I thought I'm never going to climb again because I think the method of instruction was by these paramilitary uh, uh, instructor, rock climbing instructors from ITBP, and I think it was at that time. I, I'm sure things have changed, but that time it was not you. Uh, you didn't never wanted to climb again. The way it was taught, uh, it was it was crazy. Uh, and then I think uh, maybe because it was, um, I said I don't think I want to do it again. But then uh, something must have really clicked to say, oh, let me give it a shot again. And I went for another course through Delhi Mountain Association in to Nenital, and that was a very nice experience to Bada Patthar. That was 80, 81. I think I was 10 or 11. Uh, but the thing, those courses were great and fun. But the point is then what the step forward is. How do you pursue the sport? So there were no climbers or clubs or walls where you could where you could say, okay, let me start. No, I need someone and they start climbing. So either is it going to do another course or are you, what are you going to do? I mean, that's a question, right? Then I came across this article by Mandeep Singh. I'm grateful to him for that. Uh, in uh, Indian Mountain, I think 1981 issue. I remember very clearly, I read about 640 times probably just that year, yeah, that article. And I was like so excited. So this is about old rocks, you know, Ladu Sarai. And he talked about it's like the English style guidebook writing, you know, the roots up here. And and actually, I got a friend together. We bought, we, we didn't have gear, so we went and bought from our pocket money, went and bought some carabiners from Supreme Equipment in Daria Ganj. Uh, I knew some of the gear because we had done those courses, right? So uh, we went and bought this carabiner and we bought, uh, we got an old nylon rope, like a thick rope. Uh, which, you know, it's not a washing line, but a thicker version of it, like 12 mm or something. And some pitons and got some handmade pitons by by these guys on the roadside who forge metal. And we actually started going to all rocks and side climbing. The more fun was rappelling down. Actually, we would rappel down all day. So that was the fun part. And I think I just got hooked on to spending time at old rocks and gradually meeting people in Hodge and go to climbing there. And, yeah, that's how I met Mandeep and Ron Kanai and Robert and all these people and they were quite active then. Uh, that's how climbing started. Yeah. I wanted to actually ask you a little bit about Robert. I mean, you know, he's a name that pops up a lot. And for a lot of people who started climbing, you know, whether it's even 20 years ago, they probably haven't heard of these names as much. Mandeep, yes, but you told me about Robert Chambers. So can you elaborate a little bit about him just so robert was involved with uh, at that time when he was in delhi i think the late uh, late 70 early 80s probably 80 81 he was here as uh, working with ford foundation he was in the development sector so he was in kenya earlier and he's he's a guru he's a development guru even now he works with the uh, international development studies in sussex so i still heard he heard i mean i heard from him in an email like last month it must be in his uh, maybe late 80, early 90s or something. It must be 88, 89. The only time I actually had the courage to ask him how old he was when I was. So that's how I calculated his age. When I was 9, 20 and he was 57. So because one uh, one uh, chap in an old village asked him how old he was and he said he was 57. So I guess there was a 37 year age gap. So that makes him 89. I'm 52 now. So he must be 89 now. That's how I keep calculating. This was way back in 89 when I asked him this question. <laughs> when I remember this incident. Anyways, 
So I, Robert was uh, working in a development uh, world in Delhi, in, and he was living in Delhi, and he was super keen. He was a hardcore guy. Development in terms of climbing also. So every Saturday or Sunday, he would be off in his van. And like I said, I mean, I think I mentioned uh, earlier, and you know, transport was very, very, uh, very rare in those days. You had to take a bus. You had to take a bus to Ballabgarh, then change another bus to Dodge, then walk in three kilometers to climb, and do the same on the way back. Sometimes you just had to sleep the night. You wouldn't bother to come back and just. Just lie in the dust in the, in the bun and eat some food in the village and sleep there because there was just too much to go back. So a car was a luxury. You know, I mean, this guy Robert had a van. So he was like, oh my God, it was great. So everyone used to meet in Malcha Market early morning at 6 or whatever. And he would just go. And he also, the good thing is that he started, which is something I keep telling Jamie and other people and whoever developing climbing. So he started doing that very early, he's documenting the climb. He actually started drawing sketches naming areas, doing, I think and that is, and I was like, oh, okay, as a 15 year old, you know, you say whatever, Robert, but it's really mattered because of the fact that that documentation actually saved the rocks in much. Because when the Haryana government officials or the mining people or the DC asked like, who climbs here, what is this? You actually show them the guidebook and say, look, or this is the, you know, it's a documented area. The whole perspective changes when they see something on paper. And so I say the preservation of rock was when the guidebook helped him do that. So Robert did that and he went back to England, I think, uh, went back in 85, 86 or 87. Back in 85, it's 85, around that time. And then he came back, but to Hyderabad and then we didn't even really climb in Dodge. But Damdama and Dodge were two areas when he was helped, you know, he was very focused for about four or five years to go on. I read about that when you guys contacted the Chief Secretary of Haryana, I think, to talk about mining problem in Dodge. How did you manage to even get there? Because right now in Bangalore, you know, there's quarrying issues happening in a lot of the areas surrounding uh, the place. And it's just super hard to get to someone who can take a decision or who can place a personal phone call. And essentially with that level of power and influence, who can place a phone call and say, stop. So, and as climbers, I imagine at that time, y'all didn't have a lot of uh, influence in the government and so on. So how did you actually manage to get across to such a high level of bureaucracy? So, uh, yeah, Dylan, that's where I think Chambers came in. I was just a 14-year-old here. I had no contacts. Get anywhere. Even to the headmaster. Forget about getting to chief secretary. Or, you know, so uh, Chambers was quite a well-known figure, you know, in the development sector. So he was also meeting very top people in... Uh, the bureaucrats uh, in the government. So when he he actually rang that bell and uh, and and he spoke right to the chief secretary. And I, there's in fact a telegram which I saw. I have to see someone took a picture of it. I don't know. I, I remember seeing a photograph of a very old telegram which was sent from chief secretary office to DC Haryana because there was nothing else, right? So they actually sent stop mining, stop dodge, like that kind of stuff whatever, Mangar, Hill, etc. And they actually stopped it. So he had access. I think Mandeep, of course, uh, you know, Mandeep and uh, uh, probably knew a few people there, but I think it was more Robert who knew the development. Being, you know, top guru in Ford Foundation. So that helped. I mean, I think it's luck. Like what you're saying is about connecting with people. It's the same way, like in India, if you know someone and that guy knows another guy, and that's a difference. And they know that this is a genuine, you know, a genuine plea because a lot of it could be just nonsense uh, possible. So they don't know what is happening. You know, the guy sitting somewhere in Chandigarh or if he's in Bangalore, he's sitting in Bangalore where the crags are up like 200 kilometers away. They don't know what's happening on ground. You know, it's hard for them to know. But if, they, if the route is a genuine route where they know that these people are, uh, whoever is making that plea is a known person, then I think it helps. Uh, but I think it's got to do with your connections and luck, really. I think we got lucky that Robert was there and this blasting was happening and then he's, you know, he connected and the thing happened right away. And the, and, I'm, and I keep, I'm happy that it's still, you know, the, obviously something really drastic happened at that time that they, even now they don't touch those areas, touch wood. I mean, seriously, I mean, this, this is, uh, no, normally these things come up in every five, ten years, someone starts to hide these rock and say, oh my God, that stopped in 83, by the way, that boring uh, actually stopped in 83 and it's, it's like, what, 30 years, 37 years. So obviously, I, I, you know, one worry is that you know something might be coming up 
no, five, ten years, something of boils up and people say, oh, no, no one climbs on this, let's just break them or whatever. Else. But that's not happening. One little crag has disappeared, I know. Bali has disappeared. That was a, once we went there, it, there's no crag there. That was on the far end of Anthean area, one of the areas in Norge. But, you know, more or less it's been intact, which is good. Because Robert used to say this, because Robert used to say this and it just got stuck in my head, is that, look, you can actually grow a tree. If you cut down a tree, you can actually grow it. You know, but when you break the rock, you can never reconstruct it. And that's a fact. Once your rock comes down, that's it. It's the end of a million years of erosion and weathering and formation of the rock, right? Yeah, man. It's, uh, I don't know what to say. It's so scary that it's all still, you know, it's all, it all works on such a networking basis. If you know someone and you're there at the right time, then, you know, something can click. Otherwise, it's just gone. And um, I remember as I mentioned how authorities tend to value when they see something on print. I remember a similar thing happened to me in uh, Thrilli in Bangalore. For some time, there were cops at the entrance. And I went with Arvind and Gauri, a couple of friends, and we wanted to just go for a bouldering session. And there were these two cops and they stopped us. And then, you know, this whole drama started where you have to explain why you're going over there, you know, what climbing is. And, it, it, and especially bouldering, man, it, it, it sounds a bit absurd to them. Because the first thing they will say is, oh, in our village, you know, oh, you know, it means there's a really big face in our village, come there and climb. Right. And so we have to just sort of first get them convinced on bouldering. And uh, it was going nowhere, that conversation. We were trying to tell them, yeah, we do this. It's a sport. Uh, a lot of people across the world practice this, blah, blah, blah. It happens in Humpy. And then we pulled out the Bangalore climbing guidebook, which Sohan and the other guys from uh, BCI have worked on. And then they started looking at it and suddenly something clicked. It was like it got legitimized. Right, right, and right. then they became a lot more sympathetic. And then came level two, which was be careful. You have a girl with you. Last week, there was a murder over here. And then I was like, OK, we will climb that boulder, just the one that you can see over there. And I still remember it's a, it's a line called Dark Cloud. And we were like, we will only be on that boulder because we came all the way here and we don't want to go back without climbing. And you, you can see us very clearly. So please just let us go to that one. And then it took us like half an hour. And then finally they're like, okay, okay, okay. But you know, just I'm telling you the shit that happens over here. So um, be careful. It's really interesting. And you've traveled quite a bit. You've traveled to the United States and Europe and access issues are so different in these places, you know, I mean, especially now in the U S mm. they have access fund and their bodies and, um, it's a little bit raw. Yeah, but the challenge is still there, Dylan, because uh, even there, I mean, I remember climbing the Gunks in the or something, 89, and there was this more, uh, climbing a route I want to do called the Foops. It's a very famous uh, line of 511, which has got a roof crack on it or so on. You know, something you do. Uh, and I could, when I went there, the, the Mohong Preserve, which was a private uh, landowner's resort there, bro, wouldn't allow people to climb there. Yeah. That whole Mohong Preserve left of the Traverse was not allowed. And I believe now the whole area is shut. So they are, I mean, you know, maybe if you know Mohong Preserve people or some very top guy, they will be allowed. To or the guest of the Mohong Preserve. Will so those things happen. I mean, and I'm sure more people start climbing there. So that's going to, access is going to be a very big, uh, you know, I was, really, I was just listening to a podcast with, me, with Alex Honnold and some people uh, in, uh, on, uh, I think it was the Nugget Climbing podcast. And he was talking about uh, how they're going to might start limiting people in Yosemite on the bill walls and stuff, where they're going to have, you know, because of access issues, that so many parties are going up in one row. So uh, all those things might come up, yeah. The more people go, that's what happens. Because I was also mentioning, which is not a bad thing, where I was telling someone in Bangalore that we never really, ha I never had a problem. I've been, there, been going there since 86, of course, on a regular basis. Maybe a few years I haven't gone there. But we never had access to shoes because I think it was very low-key, the whole sport and one random guy is climbing on some betta here and there did not matter. But we have more people, like 200 or 100 people coming there, parking cars and way. Then I think change, the, you know, it's going to change the attitude of people or authorities. But that happens. I'm not saying people, not so many people should go, but I'm saying that's when the change happens I think, also. Well, uh -huh. so even, even in a place like remote places like in India with remote climbs in India where not you know you don't have two hundred people climbing at a time. It's not like not like where hundreds of 
thousands of cars there. Or Standard Gen in England, where it's all you know, on a weekend, where there be a few hundred, two thousand cars here. So, but that that is a worldwide problem here. Even in Krabi, I remember we in, uh, in that area which is in Princess Cave. I went there in '93 when the timing had just started. I think we just started developing in '92. The year was there '93, and the whole area was open. You could do what you want. Next visit in 2000, Princess Cave was closed because they had built a five-star hotel right next to the cave, and they didn't like naked, you know, bare-chested climbers grunting up some rock and all that. So they decided to oh, shut this shit down. And <laughs> our guests don't like people hanging on these rocks, and they are actually shut. And that's such a magical place, just amazing, stunning. I mean, unbeatable. I mean, I can't imagine a place like that. I was like, whoa. The next time you go there, yeah, you, should, you can't climb it. Because, you know, whatever. So, I mean, that's a problem. Of course. When you guys were climbing in the um how do people look at you in the 80s? Uh, was it strange? Did they look at you guys with wonder and amazement? Or was it a bit, uh, a bit of contempt in the way that they looked at you? I think we never initially, yeah, in, uh, in early eighties, of course, people looked at. They just, which kind of, I think, it got, it got normalized because everyone was coming in so often there. The climbing was happening every Saturday, Sunday. It was that. See, climbers and explorers club used to have the camp. It became kind of normalized, yeah. like people, oh, people climb. Of course, they looked at the ropes, you know, but it was never, you know, never, in the early eighties to mid eighties, was never very. Uh, people just watched, and I made a lot of friends because they saw us. So often, some of the youngsters who are now, you know, you see them every day, like, uh, they were hanging around there also. You know, you would play Kuli Danda with them or just hang out with them, taking a break. And they would see you so often that they just became friends, you know. I mean, they never tried climbing. You, I never even offered also because you didn't know what's going to happen. But uh, yeah, it was, um, I think it was it was fairly okay in terms of them. I think it became normalized. You know, people say, oh, this, the people do this. That's fine. It was one of those things. Yeah, I think they just see it often enough. I've had this experience in uh, uh, Himachal, you know, when the first time they see you with a crash pad and uh, you're bouldering, it's a bit, it's all, and, and, and if you're alone, it's, it just seems a bit absurd, the whole thing. Yeah. It's like, you know, you're going into a forest with, you know, two crash pads and brushes, and it's like, what does this guy do? But then they see it over and over again, and more people come, and then they realize that, oh. okay, you know, it's a thing. And yeah, in some places, they take well to it. In some other places, they're like, yeah, I don't know, these guys are a little crazy but whatever it's, it's their thing when did you you were mentioning um, Bangalore and what the scene was like over there when did you first go down south so I went after my 12th board exam which was in 1986 so that uh, you know, I got some money from home and they said yeah so my friend Teji uh, Purana who's a doc in, now in the US and we were climbing together and Mandy Singh and all had uh, and Ron Kana and Charu had put up the room in Savadurga the Babali so that was our uh, route to go to, you know, and uh, and I, it was uh, it was early April, and of course when we saw the temperature, it was like yeah, thirty six degrees, no big deal, man. We climb in forty five. Of course, Bangalore thirty six is really hot. You know, it's the sun is so sharp. And we, I mean, I know we know. So we took a train down, and Teji and I climbed for boots. We made the probably the second ascent of the Pavali. We got completely dehydrated by the time we got to the top. And uh, we obviously met the nation or others later. We went to Kabal. We were traveling by buses. In fact, the, the Bavli was like a two, three day affair because we had to take a bus to Magri. Then from Magri, we had, which, and the bus on the way, caught, so everyone jumped out of the bus. There were like 300 people inside the bus. And you know, it's exaggerated. It must be 150. And then by the and so what happened? So I think the bus caught fire. But by the time we got out, the fire had already been, yeah, it was crazy. The, the, they had already extinguished the fire. Now we got back into the bus. Someone had did something. You know how you know, we ended up Margaret, We spent, we got there for lunch from Bangalore to call him. Um, that night we slept in Naikan Palya, the, you know, the gate to South Africa. So we actually had to spend the night there. We couldn't even get to the base in a day. So we slept the night there. Next day we walked into the base. And by the time it was nine o'clock and I was like, you can't wait to get on this, man. We've taken a train for two days, then we've taken this overnight bus ride to the river. Like, you have to get on because it's all already getting really hot. And we started at maybe at 10 o'clock, which is you know how things are. And we, I think we reached the top in about 3 4 o'clock, but we were completely dehydrated and burnt out by the time we reached the top. So that was Savandurga, and then we went to other cracks like Kamal and uh. 
and uh, the place is Ramanagaram. We spent with Ibrahim's farm area. That's where we met Dinesh and other people in the Kumbh Mela. That time they were climbing in hunter boots. My wee guys from Delhi Wallas had I had borrowed a rock, a rock piece. I had a, and I had a chalk bag. And other guys, oh my God, chalk is very helpful for climbing kind of a thing. <laughs> so it was damn fun. It was damn cool. But Dinesh was still in hunter boots. This is the worst thing I know. Yeah. They were wearing hunter boots. They didn't have chalk. We had one row between the three of us. So um, we went to Ramnagaram and climbed some of the boots. And there were four of us. Eventually, I think Dinesh decided that it's too risky to climb with one row. I mean, AG, my friend, actually, he was a more sensible guy. So, so Dinesh and I went back to um, to climb in some to, to get an, uh, another rope. We went back to Bangalore. We met up with Spark people because they were the few guys with ropes. And on the way back, we had we got we had to sleep on the Chandpatna railway station here because we couldn't get back to Kabal. The last bus had left at nine thirty or ten, so we were sleeping on the platform. And like next morning, the guys are coming sleeping on the platform. <laughs> and we ran from there and we took the bus. So it was great fun. It was a great time. And after that, of course, we had uh, so that was the first time in '86. And after that, we uh, that's another story, though. Second part of the story when my one of our Swedish friends, okay, who also started climbing in Dodge, he had rented a he was living in Trivandrum, so he had a beach beach hut overlooking the overlooking the beach there. So so we spent the rest of the holiday there. Anyway, so that was the first time, and we got hooked. I mean, I really thought it was a great time. What did you think of the rock when you went down? It, it felt different to Dodge's rock, obviously, and Daddy's rock. Did you enjoy it, the granite? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, uh, yeah, Dylan, that, see, earlier, uh, I think the whole uh, fun was to go and climb in different areas. Was, you know, in the sense that you climbed in areas. At least for me, it was more traveling and going to another place. So, one, uh, yeah, it was very different. The slabs were I mean, run out, so you had to sort of balance out. But I think... I think when you're 17 or 18, things are, you know, a different perspective, right? You're just like, so don't go about everything that doesn't matter. So you run it out, do whatever you want. You know, it's just, it's just a thing. But I really enjoyed it. Of course, it was, it was, a, it was a different experience. And, but I do say that we, our experience of climbing a dodge really helped. Because, you know, wherever the placements were, we could detect it very quickly. And uh, climb the cracks better. Because obviously, more climbing and uh, dodge, we get used to placing gear. That helps. I think that helped me a lot in, in wherever I climb, drag boots at least. But that's a, such a good training ground that you could, uh, even if I went into the gunks to climb or the UK, I mean, not a great hard routes or something, but at least I could, you know, tempt some things. So that happened even in Bangalore. We picked a lot of the big lines there. But when we went back in 89, we did that Duvray, the whole Banerjee pillar, you know, there were five or six tracks. All those were done in one trip. So, uh, because one, you know, had the experience of climbing there. You've actually but put up quite a lot. Definitely, it was uh, a yearly. Uh, some rules, yeah, because we were picking those lines then, because there were cracks, there were no one was doing it. So, one had that opportunity. So, it was every year one had to go, one had to go and make a trip to Bangalore. And there was a one big trip, which I think I was not there, and it was in 91 December when there were like 15 people from Delhi, Dipendar, and Kuni, and Deepak, uh, and all these guys, Annie, and they all went to Bendu, all went down to Bangalore and they had a crazy time climbing for about two weeks there. So, oh. so I try to make it a point to get back there more often. 91, uh, 91 you competed, if I get this right. And I don't know how many people know this about you, but uh, you were part of the first Indian team that competed, right, internationally. You went to Tokyo. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, 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 so we were. Why did you decide to go? How did this come about? So, in uh, I think the sport climbing, I I'd spent about eight nine months in England, uh, not climbing. I was trying to study, and I thought it was a. Uh, I, mean, I was in a park where there was no climbing, and I really didn't like it. But then, in that time, when I was away, there was this movement happening in the IMF with Captain Kohli. They, they talked about, you know, they were trying to promote sport climbing. Sport climbing was just taking off. And they actually invited two guys from uh, France, one coach, climbing coach, Henry Pelasson. He was the coach of the French team that time. And uh, and another guy called Jean-Marc, uh, uh, I think, I don't know this uh, full name, but Jean-Marc was an architect who was building walls then. So they, And they did it through the Ministry of External Affairs to uh, the French government and they called them to promote sport climbing and I think a lot of these people attended the workshop here. 
so obviously if they were looking at sport line people looking at sport line in 91 and kept only i think it was futuristic so then there was a world cup which was happening in japan and then we just said we must send a team i mean people should go and see what's happening at least india should get represented so maybe not the fairest of selection process like you just random four people who we were climbing then so there was paranji there was uh, alka ani and i we went and uh, in october of the, to check out uh, we participated in the world cup how was it the comp it's i'm asking because so many people who compete today won't even born then and uh, you know competitions have just changed so much but this was way back when in 91 and i was actually doing a little bit of uh, research about that comp and there were a lot of uh, pretty big names competing in that i think there was uh, yuji hirayama and jibe tribo and fred nicole and yeah eli shavu yeah eli shavu yeah. all these guys yeah 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 all these guys because yeah, yeah because japan obviously was hosting the first competition so they were very keen to get people across and i think they must have you know they, they were very generous in terms of uh, i don't know what the other things but they try to get as many people as usually won the competition was 18 or 19 but they actually won that uh, yeah, robin davis field did their robot all these people your artist uh, uh all these guys were there it was completely fascinating because the walls was is a very important you never really climbed on climbing walls or such it was only rock climbing there was no they made one small 12 by 8 foot wall here at the iron of that was their training ground there So you obviously went down with all of these people and uh, and of the climbs and uh, obviously you saw the standards and you could understand that these guys trained a lot together and there was a lot of seriousness and it was great fun it was, it was amazing of course there were no expectations of anything but it was more like it was great exposure I did a competition after that was I got actually a little quite inspired by that and I did one in uh, in Singapore in '93. In which uh, yeah I, I managed to go through to the semi final but there were very few people that was so top so they, Singapore used to host a competition to popularize climbing uh, right in the middle of the city like they built a wall and they called people and then you know the whole city would see climbing there it's sort of amazing way to promote climbing so I did that in '93 uh, and then I met those boys from Thailand who were developing uh, Krabi then uh, and uh, actually joined them later climbing with them. So, and for that competition is uh, when uh, that's how my idea of my. In fact, my dad accompanied me. He was doing nothing. He was like, "Why are you going alone? I should come with you." I mean, have a look. What's happening? What is this competition? It was quite nice. He was kind of retired, and then he actually came with me, and he was like, "Why? Why are you competing when you can't climb on a wall like this? I mean, you're climbing on rock, and then you're trying to climb on this. I mean, I don't get it." So it was a very logical and a very basic kind of information that he gave me. I said, like, we don't have a wall. He said, no. But then, if you want to climb on a wall, then you get a wall. And so, why don't you build a wall yourself so you can climb on it, and or whatever? I mean, what's the point? And because I was looking, oh, there's one competition in China. I should go there. And he was like, I don't see any point. You should, I mean, go. But then, what's the point? If you're not going to train on it, it was a very, you know, we had this conversation. And it was a very practical man's company. He was a practical guy. So I was thinking on next competition, while oh, I should go there or here. Uh, But it was more, uh, yeah. So we actually, that's where the whole thing about building climbing walls came. That we should, you know, I built it for myself and then went for it. But it was hard to get. So the wall we built the first, no, no, the wall we built was in my my my, my mother has a school. She started that. She was the founder of the school. Now she knows more. But uh, so she said, why don't you build a wall in the school? Because then the kids can also benefit from it. Apart from your own training. It's a new sport. The kids can benefit, and at that time, the IMF was in the process of building a climbing wall, but the thing was just taking too long. The foundation was done in '91, and it was just three, four years. It was still lying on the ground, even though a friend worked on it. Tata, good. Uh, so, in the meantime, she said, "Why don't?" You know, we just do it on the small build. So basic climbing wall in Singapore, which was just made on the side of the building, holds bolted on it, and there was a big overhang, a little overhang on top, which is made of plywood and metal thing. It was just the same thing. So, we, and then we hosted a climbing competition, and it's where we had people from Manipur who like came in a train for three days, you know, four days in Bangalore. We had Vietnam who actually sent a team of fifteen twenty people. So we had like fifty five people competing on this wall. And in fact, the crazy part is that if you uh, you know steam up here, right? It's in his book that climbing wall. In fact, he was in Pahar Ganj or wherever, 
two of our friends was also root setting and they were they were these uh, two guys we knew were part of the Johnny Dawes Paul Pritchard group were coming up. They actually told Steve Baker who was hanging out in Power Guns, hey, there's a climbing competition, why don't you come? And he actually came and he, he won the cup. I mean, he won an international cup. And he's got that in the book. So if you, you see that book, it, I, uh, Steve McCurl's new book, whatever, you know, one it's just probably not forget the name. So he's actually got a photograph of the wall and he climbed on that. Uh, yeah, obviously, he became famous later. So that competition kicked off. Yeah, so that competition also kicked off the Bangalore wall, which was Miguel Now, when the nation all knew, you know, they kind of convinced the. Uh, uh, the administrative officer, the top boss, they would build a wall. And that holes for the wall was actually made by our, the our school art teacher, who used to live in a Baisati. So he said, hey, how do we make these holes? So, so he said, yeah, I'll, I'll help you. And we actually started making more. The holes are, by the way, still used on the climbing wall. Right? Some of them, they still exist. They made up, there's a resin. We made these molds, which were like one-time molds, you know, with plaster of Paris. And, uh, and then the back, so we made these holes for our wall, school wall, it was framed by the school, you know. And the same holes we took down the Bangalore in the train, so they're in our holes. They just had the plywood wall. It was understanding that we make it bring the holes down and then same holes will be used and then brought back to Delhi. And that competition was held like a month later, Bangalore. And that had a huge attendance, by the way. There were like 250 people. This is quite amazing. I don't know. Just some, and people were willing to sit in isolation for six hours, let's say eight hours and all, which probably... I don't think it'll happen now, or maybe it does. I don't know. Because we're just waiting for a turn to come and to climb one time. It was quite bizarre. I've heard I've heard stories of uh, you know the old uh, Bangalore competitions before it shifted to Kantibha Stadium, where the line used to be so long that it would start at the wall and then it would go up the building all the way to the second <laughs> floor, and everyone would just basically be waiting for their turn. Right, right, and, right, right, uh, right. I was chatting with Tom Randall of Lattice Training once, and he was telling me that. In 98, he competed. He was in India and he competed in a competition on that wall. And he was uh, telling me, he was like, you know, it was just amazing to watch the ability of some of these climbers. They had no real formal training. Many of them were competing bare feet, but they climbed so well and just so instinctively. Yeah, it's it's super interesting to see, you know, how far climbing comes, especially competitions. I mean, waiting for six hours, eight hours, now no way. People right, are going to get right. uh, really irritable. Right, I mean, right. Rightfully so in the modern context. But you were, you were on a bit of a performance streak at this point, right? And if I remember from one of our conversations in 94, you were climbing at a really solid level. You climbed one of your hardest routes in uh, Malham, was it there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which one was that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think it's called Total Recall. I still remember the name because I, I think I have a good memory for roots and uh, that's that's probably the only thing I have a good memory for. And uh, so um, so in 94, I went for a climbing uh, rock climbing meet. I'd already gone uh, for the BMC where, uh, and uh, where we spent like seven days climbing around. And then after that, so it was a good, uh, yeah, I was quite in good shape then, even though... Uh, um, you we know, not climbing on walls or anything. I was mostly training at PBG or whatever. Yeah, I managed to do a 7C uh, and a 7C, it's a 7C plus if you're a shorter person. So I managed to red point it pretty quickly. And uh, some of the trad routes was around E4, E5. So I was in decent shape then, uh, climbing in 94. But after that, I didn't really, maybe I did, but I was not training as hard then. Maybe I got started working more. But yeah, 94 was a good year. What was your training was, like at this point? So, uh, I was always, uh, to be honest, uh, didn't very interested in training, just for the heck of training. It was not, nothing to do with just I have climb better. So, I, when I started climbing, within a few months, I was actually doing some form of training. Whether it was pull-ups or whether it was loading bricks in a you know, knapsack and trying to climb the, you know, the under stair, uh, the, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. the, uh, under the staircase. staircase. Okay, yeah, re- because you didn't have much information, so you could actually follow some articles. So, I did try to... I would read up some stuff and try. It was not very structured, but I would do. And also, I spent a long time traversing on PBG because if there were no climbing partners, so you don't want to have people hanging on the rope, or, you know, doing laps. So PBG, which is the president's bodyguard, had this is a bouldering area in Delhi where you have these three long traverses. Long means about they range from 50 to 60 feet. And uh, what you could do is you just spend hours traversing up and down. So it makes your ability to stay on the rock, which I felt was important for track climbing, where you know you. 
you hang out, you rest, you get pumped, then you go back again, or tie some weights around, keep doing that, because then then you don't have to, you know, you don't have to wait for partners to come. You can actually do that for a few hours. So I try and do 3,000 feet, 4,000 feet of traversing. So the inability of, so it's just, it's not steep, it's vertical, it's not overhanging on anything. So that was one form I thought helped me build endurance. And uh, just do a lot of volume, even if no one's there, you can just go and do that. So in early, so I built a backer ladder, I was still working on the campus. Well, you know, backer ladder was uh, around 86, 87, which is quite fine. You got, you got strong pretty fast, but I didn't have a structure. I didn't have someone to tell me, look, you don't do, overdo this. So one time I remember, uh, you just climb straight for 20 days straight, every day at PBG. 20 uh, days? Day, you know, we do yeah, I mean, a friend of mine decided that we want to climb every day. And you just want to keep doing for us. Because after 20 a day, I think we were just completely like, everything was just paining. We couldn't even like hardly able to walk back. Uh, so obviously that was not the best strategy. So we just tried things. Uh, random stuff, but training was important. So it was not just like once in a while, we were going to just try. There was going to be some training. Involved because it was just for the fun of it, which is what I like even now. In terms of not just climbing training, but you know, knowing about training. Whether it's cycling or swimming or anything else. It's actually, that's pretty hardcore, man. I mean, the level that you achieved, 70 plus in in 94, uh, even by today, even by today's standards in India, if you can lead 70 plus, you are really give or take at the top. You near the top. And that was such a good level. Were you tempted to kind of go deeper into training and sort of, you know, chase the higher grades? Or were you just, I don't know, was your focus elsewhere? Yeah, so, no, no, definitely. I would have, uh, definitely, I guess, was to do harder routes because I think that time people were uh, then more interested in the uh, HC in Duke. Uh, I think 89 was the uh, year which he did that. Uh, 89 or 90. I was in that year, I was in Duke, by the way, the same year. I, I must have missed him by a few months or a few weeks or something when they did the action court. Yeah, the idea was to do the start doing other stuff. I think I got stuck into work and I actually got married. And uh, I, I think he started focusing on various other things. And uh, also the thing was that um, when the traveling got down a little bit. I'm not going to blame it on that. Just too many things happened in those, that time where I think one had to decline. The horse was getting climbed out for me in the sense I could find more stuff to do at my local track. Which is if you have a huge crag which is available, access, uh, which could access. In the, yeah. Otherwise, we didn't have to travel. But the traveling got cut down and mm, even I was still climbing a lot, but then I was not able to develop more routes. I think we needed another another place where, you know, because most of my harder routes and stuff was done in Dodge. And maybe a new or a bigger area would have helped or I would have found something more convenient, close to where I could have worked on these routes. Otherwise, it was meant to be traveling, which I couldn't do much. Which is, um, what were you working at at this point? Sorry, what, where was I? What, uh, I meant, I said you started work in 94. That's what you said. So what was work at this point? So at that time, I just, I was dropping my teaching job, which I'd done for about two years. I was teaching geography, environment, science, in really great schools. You know, I'm not a trained teacher, but it was great fun. I was given the opportunity to do it. So I did that. So I was getting out of that and I was starting to build climbing walls. That's the first time when we actually got approached by one of the units in the army who said, look, why don't you build the climbing wall for us for training? So I got sucked into that business end of the climbing walls, which I think was very, very taxing. I mean, I was enjoying it. It was, it was a lot of learning because I don't have an engineering background or anything. So when I had to learn about, you know, structures and forces and materials and, and the ability to scratch and actually I didn't have resources to actually hire too many people. So I do a lot of the first wall. I, mean, I was on my own doing that stuff. Actually, at the site and you know, putting up panels and building stuff. So I think I got stuck in the business end of it, which was important. To, you know, I had to give a lot of time to make it a success. And, and as you know, that time you didn't have the mobile phones or anything. You, you know, you had a landline, you had a call from there, you had a fax, you had to type your own letters, send them off. So everything was done from scratch. You know? And uh, like I said, I didn't have resources to hire too many people. So it took a lot of energy to build this. It took me away from the climbing of it. Yeah, I can, I can imagine this. You know, I have these uh, conversations with Vrinda every now and then. And 
sometimes people think, oh, if you're building a bouldering gym or you're in the climbing business, I mean, this is an outsider perspective, of course, but they think, oh my God, you're just right in the thick of things and, you know, climbing is your life and now you can just get better and better. But, you know, the, the business end and the construction end and, uh, I don't know, the publication end, it sort of just really eats into your mental bandwidth and the actual climbing ends up becoming, uh, yeah, less and less. You just have less energy for it. I know what, I know what you mean. Did you... Did you feel bad about this? Was there a point when you were just really irritated about this and were you questioning your decisions? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Dylan, because that took that, there were no climbing walls. So you're, you're breaking, you're actually creating an industry. So you know, you're actually, you know, actually going to people and saying, hey, you want to build a climbing wall or, or people coming to you. And it's not, I mean, at one point, and you need to have systems in place, you need to have your processes. Doing it, and at one point I was dreading if someone gave me an order. I was like, "Hey, can you build a wall for us?" And he actually, and I was like, "Oh my God, I don't want to do it." I mean, it took a lot of energy. Yes, and it was a new. So once it was not just about selling the concept; it's also about building the whole thing efficiently and getting money back out of them, and doing the taxation and doing the accounts and doing other stuff. Which is which is like uh, any other construction. Actually, I tell people it's like any other construction business. You, know, you get excited, then it's a climbing wall, fine. But the process is the same of building anything. So yeah, a lot of time one felt bad. What am I doing? This is just taking too much energy, just endless. Uh, I, spent, I remember doing the Calcutta Wall in 97, 98 in Salt Lake Stadium. It was one of the bigger walls of the country. It just took me seven, eight months of most of the year. Most of the time I was going back and forth, trying to build, deal with labor getting construction guys to build, get the welders, get the engineers, get permissions from the government, dealing with government people. So, and I was completely novice at it. I had no idea. I mean, just completely new to this. I was operating from home, so you on a shoestring budget, you wouldn't have money because you pay, you know, you wait for your money once the government, that's how it works, once you invest and then you the time and they give you the money. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of error. And it's not ending, huh, by the way, I'm still at it. But I'm just telling you. <laughs> so it, it is. It is a constant. Uh, yeah, it's a life of an entrepreneur. You act it. There's no question. Why did you stay, if I may ask? At this point when you knew this was hard work, it was a lot of red tape. And, you know, like you said, it was like any other construction job. And you knew this was eating into your climbing time. What made you stay in this business? I don't know, man. I, I have nothing better to do, I guess. I guess I just thought that this is what I'm going to do. And I just stuck with it. I don't know. I'm like that. I think I just want to start something. I just keep at it. <laughs> it takes me a long time to realize that maybe this is not what I want to do. Even if I say it's not what I want to do, I still get it. Maybe this is one of, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, yeah. I, mean, I never th- actually thought about doing something else, but never really. You know, I was just like, no, no just keep Plugging and that's it. So I don't know why. I have no answer. Right. It's kind of like, uh, if I can draw an analogy, it's sort of like climbing a really exposed route. You can't second guess and you can't really think too much. You do something, you just trust it and you keep just going with it and going with it and going with it. <laughs> <laughs> you just, you have no choice but to keep going with it. Late 90s, um, the early 2000s from my understanding, you know, your generation, you guys pretty much trained on rock. Most of your time was outdoors. Uh, there was no real separation. But I think towards the early 2000s, maybe the late 90s, there was a bit of a separation between you know competitive and indoor climbers and then those who were only climbing outdoors. Uh, how did you feel about this? So yeah, there was uh, this transition where a lot of the uh, youngsters were talking about, you know, climbing in the walls or trying just competing and not. So I used to, I actually felt that now that they were getting stronger on the wall, they should have gone onto the rock and at least repeated some of the routes or tried or worked on them. A lot that didn't happen. I I mean, I was a bit quite disappointed actually because I thought now that these kids are getting so strong, now they think you climb on, you know, uh, on steady steep walls and they're getting strong. That's that, you know, you should be getting a transition on the rock, but that didn't happen. So I was quite disappointed when there was no interest, even though I kept, I was quite vocal about it. I was kept saying, oh, you should go the rock there, the roots there, you should do this and do that. But I think there was no real willingness there. Uh, I mean, that's what I found. I mean, I, maybe on one exception, but not really. You would say, oh, 
And that was the time when I think I started losing interest also in grinding and stuff. I know one one day when I just said, I'm not grinding anymore. I mean, which I, I didn't ever say, it just happened. I was supposed to meet someone the next day and that day I was at PBG and I came home and I did go, which will never happen otherwise. And I never went for many, many months. Uh, so uh, I, I was a bit disappointed that despite all the facilities and information and everything else, people did not transition to rock and climb better. Or just climb on the rock. Get stuck with just walls and competitions and not if whatever else. Even though I did that for a bit, I mean, I was also climbing on the rock for a bit because I you know, trying to keep climbing the walls a bit, but then at this one point I lost that interest. I'm going to float a theory by you. Tell me what you think. If uh, your generation, Mandeep Singh Soni, all of you guys, you all came from a certain uh, family background. You all were middle class to, you know, upper middle class. You all had, uh, you all weren't on the lower end of the income spectrum, your families especially. But what I've realized when I look at some of my friends who, you know, money is generation, Praveen's generation, many of these guys who started in the early 2000s, those who focused on competitions, they usually came from, you know, lower socioeconomic brackets and low income backgrounds. Do you think that had to do with their disinterest in climbing outdoors that, you know, whenever they climbed, they needed some sort of reward, something tangible to sort of show their parents and whoever was their support system saying, hey, I got a medal, I'm part of this team, this is why I do it. Kind of like we were talking about, you know, how when you show authority something on paper, it just makes that much more sense, something clicks. Do you feel uh, this may have had something to do with it? That's, I think, Dylan, that's possible even, even otherwise. Even in our generation, I'm sure parents and the society looks at people and saying, hey man, you went there, you did that, what happened? Something. My mom would ask me, I go swimming, she would ask me, even she was 80. She says, Oh, you want to go out? Did you win this? Man? I'm like, No, I mean, Ma, I just went to swim. Like, this is a 10 kilometer swim. I mean, isn't that good enough or whatever? You know, but yeah, no, no. She was that generation when they were, Chow, okay, you went, you know, okay, you swam. But, you know, what did, what what happened, you know, in terms of uh, did you actually win something? So I think that that happens in any case. So it depends how you deal with it. Even in our case, I'm sure in that time, a parents would question you and say, look, man, you're doing this. Did you come first? Did you come second? You know? And like I said, even in, in, when I was like 45 or something, and she's asking me, did you win this government? Like, no, I just went and ran whatever. I, had to run. <laughs> I was not going to beat the Kenyans. So it is, it is, I think, general part of society. And it just depends on the individual, how you want. You have also people who say, you know, I don't care. I mean, what, I mean it's also how you deal with it, right? But yes, that's true. That um, it's it's it, it's it, it sort of validates your uh, your going out and or traveling, or you would say going out. Because I used to, I remember that because even when I was to say, hey, I'm going on to Bangalore, I'm going to climb. It was like, what are you going to do? What is going to happen? Well, you couldn't just say, hey, I'm just going to climb there for one month. You could, but that cannot happen too often. Because then there was that question like. Can't just you know what you know, you know what I'm saying, which I kind of regret a little bit now that I should have just said, look, I am just going, I'm going again next month, and I'm just going to live under the rock. You know what I'm saying, whatever. But that didn't happen that often. So there was always that little bit of a you need to have a purpose, which could mean a you know competition was a purpose. So it's possible. Yes, I think it's that's across the board, wherever you came from. Oh. It's weird because I think competition gave you that paper, you know, oh. that certificate or that medal or something. And yeah, and I, and I guess it then just became a wave where you see a lot more people thinking in that direction and you feel, yeah, okay, fine, maybe this is the way to go. And then the disruptors probably became a little less. There was a little bit of a change, I think, after the 2010s around, you know, 11, 12, 13, there was a, suddenly a little bit uh, more of a resurgence in terms of people going outdoors and, you know, wanting to spend longer seasons outdoors, not just like, you know, two, three days on rock and kind of come back, but, you know, three weeks, four weeks, a month. Did you feel like something was coming back or how did you feel when you saw that generation? 
No, I think I, it was good to see. I was already doing uh, some other stuff, so I was not really involved. I mean, I was looking as an outsider. There. But yes, I was quite thrilled that people are actually spending that much time. Uh, whether you know people from Delhi, like Kumar, and all these guys, Akar, or Abhishek, who all go down, or Mehti, who go down, was happy, and I was quite envious. I was like, wow, this is exactly what should have been happening earlier. And where now that you have opportunity, also the fact that Dylan, in terms of fame, in terms of money, I mean. You say that you know we did come from uh, you know fairly well-off families, but it's not that we had a lot of money to just go and do stuff. That was true. Even my traveling abroad and other stuff was a lot of it. Could, I mean, I uh, don't know that I actually walked uh, you know uh, through various doors to try and get sponsors and on my own. And actually, got flight tickets. And people were actually say, "Hey, how did you manage to get a ticket from Air India?" I mean, I was just without any connections. This actually happened. So. Uh, I mean, twice or thrice, I managed to get tickets just by walking to someone's office and saying, "Look, I'm going to go," and they kind of looked at me and was like, "Who sent you?" I was like, "No, no one." I mean, just, you know, it happened. These things happen. So what I'm trying to say is, at even that time, there were very little scare. I mean, I felt there was more, little more resources and money available in early 2000. You know, people had credit cards, they had a good borrow, uh, and they could still make it happen. But in our time, there was a little more kind of. Mm, yeah, things were you didn't have that much cash, to be honest. So I think it was good that people can actually spend three weeks or four weeks and start projecting roots and doing all that. I think that's great. I think it was a good, good, good feeling that actually that now translating to what should have happened. You know, guys who competing now were strong enough are actually going to climbing and stuff. And that's going to be the change. And and the other and the people who follow them are going to probably going to be. You know, Treat them as role models. Um, you were talking about the Air India thing. What? Tell me about that a little bit. What did you say when you went in? Because I'm just trying to picture this. And it's like, okay, fine. You go into the Air India office, and what was your, <laughs> what was your angle with them? So yeah, the first time was uh, when I was, uh, you know, I got an invitation from a uh, from for a youth meeting uh, by the EMC, the British Marketing Council, and they sent a letter. I knew one of the guys, and he said, hey, "Why didn't you come for?" I mean, this was the time when he wrote letters, right? And the guy, the letter came back to me. So like, yeah, why don't you send me an invitation and maybe? Uh, so I spoke to a friend of mine here in Delhi, and he actually said, "Yeah, actually, I think my sister used to live in Bombay." And it was like, "Why don't I go?" You know, Bombay is the place, man. Delhi is not the place. He gave me some story, which I believe. And my sister was there, so I said, "Yeah, yeah, you're right. Bombay is the place. Man. That's the happening place. That's where all the money is, and that's where you think." So actually, I took a train down, and I had accommodations. So I had to stay with her, so I stayed. She was working with the government, and I stayed with her. And then, one I made a write up, and someone said, "Go to the Air India office, man. Twelfth floor. There's this guy. You just go and meet them, tell them, show you some, show, tell them what you're going to do. Then you got invited, and you know, from the UK and all that. So actually, I would, I would walk in." And I, I, I still think, I don't know what made me do that, but I would just walk in and tell them, look, there's a climbing meet, I've been invited, and uh, I think I need to go. <laughs> so I think even this 18 year old walking in someone's office is like, so the first question is, who sent you? No one sent me, I live in Delhi. But why are you in Bombay? So no, I've come to look for sponsors because I believe Bombay is, this is the headquarter of Air India. I mean, this is where you have all the, where, this is where you take the decision. This is exactly what I told him. And it clicked because the guy was actually the guy who took the decision. And I was, I forget his name now. He was, sweet chap. He was like, so what do you want? So I was like, I need a ticket to go. I mean, to, and what about the rest of the money? He said, yeah, the rest of the money I'm going to manage or whatever. I don't need much in this uh, books and nonsense. And actually I got a ticket. He said, okay, come back two months later. Or, okay, you, I said, but I'm in Delhi. Said, Are you going to be here? I said, no, I'm going to be in Delhi. He said, okay, don't worry. You contact a Delhi office and you get a ticket. And it actually happened to me. I mean, this happened twice. So I once I went to Delhi office. So once again, I tried to go to the Bombay room and they kicked me out. And this also were rejections, by the way. There were a lot of rejections. They were, they, I walked in maybe 15 offices. You know, UB Industries, Hindustan League are also giving some money. By the way. There's a very sweet lady there who's like, why oh, are you not going to compete? Is there not going to be competition? I said, no, there's no competition. Ah, there must be some small competition, I'm sure. So I said, yeah, there might be. So I go, okay, fine, because they could give money for competition sports, right? But she was trying to give me money. So she actually got me some cash and then they gave me a ticket. So that happened. I actually got three times I got lucky, which was amazing. So, <laughs> so obviously, I was not, I was just walking and talking. I think people like the honesty of my just going and saying, 
just want to go and do this. And can you help me? And that, I can. Im- I can imagine, man. I mean, obviously, I have a bias, but if I was an officer, I would. I would entirely take to your honesty. I think people like that, especially in India, when you just really go float your case and there's no bullshit. You're like, listen, I'm not here with any angle. There's no game I'm trying to play. I'm desperate. I need this help. I don't know. I think your thing is, I mean, your experiences, I think they're a lesson in actually going and knocking on doors. You are going to get rejected. You are going to be through a period when things don't work out but if you just don't go knock enough you're never going to know absolutely you're right because i remember i walked in like i said this is just a success of one i mean i walked in like every day i used to start in the morning my sister used to pack me lunch and I actually walk through all day you know nariman point and that whole area back there reclamation that was the area where the hub or the hub of obviously right no offices so you drop me off there and i would just spend the whole day walking Sometimes it's for three hours, four hours in a reception. So like, who are you, man? I mean, why wouldn't I want this person want to meet you? So, but you would just sit there, you know, spend two, three hours there. Sometimes you would meet, sometimes you would not. It's so all that happened, of course. But, you know, I spent a week, 10 days, probably, like, just doing that every day. And it worked for some time. I mean, every time I did it, it did work. Every time it's only thrice. So I did get something. So which is good. <laughs> As long as got me, the, that was the main cost, right? The ticket was the main cost. It's really the rest you can. The rest is uh, not so much because we live very cheaply. But I was, I spent like three, almost three months in France. It's almost nothing. Live in toilets, stay in someone's tent, sleep under the tree, not pay for camping. Not a great thing to do, but yeah, all that. Jump the you know, fence, go and sleep somewhere. Or you can do it cheaply. You know, you can live on nothing basically. You can if you want. You're rich. And. Uh, and the climbers are friendly people, so you know they understand that you're not you're trying to spend as long as you want. So that all that other way. I think it's all just getting there and doing it. I think that's probably probably the same. I remember this conversation I had with you and it kind of stuck with me and I often talk to people about it. You know, when here in India we talk about oh this is difficult for us and you know climbing is very young scene and we don't get sponsors and we don't get all of these things. You put something in perspective for me, which is you said, yeah. The money isn't there, but also remember that with European climbers, they need to pay rent. They don't get homemade food. They don't have a steady base to stay at. And they basically need to take care of everything in their life and then climb and perform. So yeah, we do have some disadvantages, but we also have some major advantages. And that was a really, that was a revelation because it's so easy to get into this trap of, oh, nothing's working. You know, you're on the disadvantaged uh, end of things. No one really cares, blah, blah, blah. But that opened my eyes. We had this conversation about five years ago, I think. But yeah, really, like in hindsight, thanks for that. No, no, true. When, it's only when you go out and see that. That's uh, very early. In the, in, in some of these houses, uh, this guy in Wales, I went to one of the top guys there that time, I think. I don't know, Johnny Dawes, he was not hitting there in a you know, house in Wales. You should have seen that uh, uh, way back in 94. And, I mean, this house had no heating. It was freezing inside that bed. It was on a top. It was basically slate, which was, it was amba- I think it was abandoned, which they had sort of restored. And they had like, like sheets for curtains that had been stolen from somewhere, I'm sure, or just taken from a dumpster. No, it was serious. And the guy lived through that. I mean, there were like six people living. There was, there was, it was freezing in summer there. I can't imagine the winter. He was just lying around. There were no toilets there. This guy was like a shithole somewhere, you know, he used to put on water. I mean, they were living on very basic stuff, but they were climbing really hard. And if you read Johnny, uh, Jerry's uh, stories in Revelation, in the book, where they were, they were just in that uh, Pentrum cave, I've been there, London, no, I haven't seen them sleeping there. But the Lumberton's a very inhospitable place, man. Right? Even in summer, it's dark, and it's really, and you just, they just put the sleeping bag inside their, uh, inside the cave and just be there for months. And, Oh, it's just amazing. I mean, that's the kind of, I mean, that just showed, at least when I started climbing, that, I mean, all that doesn't matter. I mean, you can do it if you want to do it, right? I mean, if you go a little hungry, you know, end of the day, you manage to do what you want. So that's, that's, I guess that's what, yeah, I mean, that's, that's how these guys were living and climbing at that level. They were top climbers, but then, it's not that someone was coming and giving them anything. I, in fact, I don't know whether I think I did tell you about that story in, uh, in Cormoyor in 96 when you've gone. I was accompanying a friend for a World Cup. His wife was competing. And uh, 
this guy who won was a Russian guy who was actually living in a campsite 20 kilometers away with his girlfriend. And he used to hitchhike every morning at 4. He used to start at 4.35 in the morning to come to the competition. And that day, when the day he won, they actually gave him a lift back. Quite generous of people. But this is the kind of level these guys are operating at. You know, it's just some basic stuff. But they're doing all that. And this was a small that. level. I mean, a lot of oh, yeah. the climbing that was happening at this time, these guys, Jerry Moffat, Johnny Dawes, they were climbing at a real cutting edge. And it's... Still hard grades. These are still absolutely, hard lines. absolutely, absolutely. Liquid amber, where, where, which is in uh, Pentruin, is where these guys were staying in like you know, one of the first eight C or nine A in uh, the UK, and they were still living on nothing. The end of the day, they were, you know, they were just like I was telling about this guy in Wales. He was he was climbing E nines and stuff, which is English grade five fourteen R X whatever. So you know, living in almost like I would spend like probably one pound a day or two pounds. So that all just scavenge out of some dumpsters and stuff. The food. They would seriously actually be on that level. Like, I actually know this incident when this when they were sitting on this table. I was having a tea. They had money to drink tea. These guys are not even drinking that. They were just drinking. And this family were left. These kids, there were three kids or something, two kids or whatever. They left their leftovers. These guys just jumped on that and just ate them up in five minutes. Like, that's the kind of level they were operating on of, of a dirt bagging here. So that's quite, quite amazing and still climb at that level. So they were not expecting people just because they climb HC or something that come and people come and someone going to give them money or, or you know, give them maybe some gear, that's it. Nothing more than that. But they didn't seem worried about it. They just were getting at it. You know, they, would, they wouldn't talk too much about it. That, oh, I met the sponsor, I did that. There was no talk about that. They just, just keep climbing. I've heard stories of this kind from Bill as well, you know, because he was not dirt bagging in the sense of living rough, but really living lean, but putting up really hard problems, you know, really hard lines, many of which are still unrepeated and you're just pretty much staying in a cave and cooking in a small pressure cooker and eating off it and man, <laughs> immense amount of development with that. So yeah, it's a lesson. It's a lesson that sometimes, you know, if you really want to do something and all the other stuff falls to the side and right. your ambition kind of goes mm. forward. How are you these days with climbing? I know you took a few years off because of uh, your injury and your switch sports and stuff. Do you feel nice coming back into it over the past couple of years? No, actually, yeah, I'm quite psyched here, actually, Dylan. Uh, few, last few years, I was not climbing that much, but then my kids, boys started climbing. Bala and Abhimanyu, uh, and it was good to introduce climbing to them. And uh, so I was good to, you know, they inspired me to get back and climb with them. And I'm actually quite, uh, now I have uh, also training much more sensibly. Uh, so I'm not, uh, I'm injury free right now, which is really good. And uh, so I, I, I think I'm training uh, the, quite a bit, but uh, just trying to get, actually get injury free and come back to climbing. Uh, do a lot more of that, spend more time, try, try and uh, try and get out of that as much as I can. But I still do other sports, you know, maybe swimming or cycling or stuff. So it balances out the day, I do something every day, so that's good. That's great, yeah. I mean, at 52, it's great that, you know, you... You have training on your mind and you really sort of want to get back in and in a sort of a serious way and then really, you know, give yourself everything that you can. It's a great mentality to have because often, you know, I've come across comments, people have said things to me, it's just people in their late twenties, they're like, Oh man, I'm late twenty now, it's over, it's done. <laughs> and, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, right. yeah, no, it's super inspiring. Well, I, I think, have, think I think after now I feel much more confident on my training because I think I, I'm a little more sensible. I would I feel I'm going to be more sensible in my training. You know, if I want to take a rest, I would do it. I want to do cross training, do something else. Earlier it was just climbing. So one went, oh my god, I'm not climbing. Shit, I'm just going to lose all my strength, and I'm going to do this, and I won't be able to walk. Now I don't care because if I don't climb, I'm doing other stuff. I go for a run. I go swimming. I get it. Yesterday uh, on, on Sunday, I just biked to the dodge. I don't climb that much, but I you know, cycled from home, met some friends, we climbed up there. It's good. So it's not like you're, you know, you don't have that thing, whole pressure of, oh my God, I'm going to get weak and my fingers aren't going to get this and that. It doesn't matter. So I think that's because that's probably going to help me get stronger. I think. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Even when I started, which was like obviously decades after you did this, oh, there's still that mentality of, rest is bad you know every rest day or if you rest two days in a row it was just like what no you're losing strength you're losing form you're losing everything you just need to stay at it until you come to a point when you can 
accept that none of this is actually making you get better and you just get sensible about it. One last question. Um, I gather that some years ago, you were also a little, not disillusioned, but unhappy that a lot of the big walls around Bangalore and just places in India weren't getting attention. Uh, does it bother you that there's so much of focus on bouldering these days and you feel like in India, climbing on rope is getting ignored or do you just not think in that direction anymore? I don't know. I don't think about it in that direction at all now. I mean, it doesn't bother me at all. Earlier, I was thinking, yeah, oh, man, these guys, but who am I to decide what people want to do, man? If they want to do this, that's fine. And, uh, I mean, it's not that I'm trying to give them direction, but, you know, I really have to be like, yeah, man, if that gets developed, this happens, that happens. They, people have the time, they have the ability, why are they not doing this? But I, I don't I don't care about it anymore, to be honest. I just don't. I think the fact that now I just feel that people are getting out is good. Whatever they're doing, it's, it's, it's good. But it will be more climbing, it's fun. If there's more development, it always helps, right? So, so as long as we keep the continuity, that what worries me is, that India is, is, is like I keep telling, I used to think that uh, 20 years ago, and even now, the same thing. That in India is such a place where if you have 10 people doing something right now, say in 2020, it's not necessary that it'll expand to 200 by 2025. It's 500 by 2030. It doesn't work like that. In terms of sports, I'm not talking about Instagram or whatever. I'm talking about sports. It's not, it doesn't work like that. Seriously. If you have some people doing, if you have 10 people doing 2020 something, it's possible that by 2015 there might be none or it could be just one. But that's happened to us too. When I was way back in college when I was climbing or friends of ours were doing motocross, they would actually, there was a big a lot of energy in those people. And I was like, wow man, the sports one of them, boom, and they were all really gung ho. 15 years later, I met these guys and I'm like, man, no one is doing it. Like literally zero. There are no motocross happening. Those Bharti mine areas or whatever they used to do. You know, happened. And that happened also with climbing. I feel it should not be that there are less people. There's a whole generation who loses out on that. And that's a fear I have. So I don't know. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope there are more boulders or more rope climbers or more big wall climbers. But it's, there should not be that there are less boulders 10 years from now than there are now. I mean, that's very much possible in a country like India. I don't know why. That is. I agree with you. I mean, you do see this happen. Is an area is really hot, and all of a sudden, there's just a lot less traffic, and just a lot less people climbing in that area. Or, yeah, it's unpredictable in that sense in India. It depends on a lot of things outside of uh, climbing itself. So, yeah, fingers crossed. Really, I hope it grows. I hope, like in all disciplines, even even comms, everything. I just hope. There are uh, more people mm. climbing and I just hope the, the infrastructure, the ecosystem around climbing is a bit more steady. So more people would want to take that plunge. You know, that if you decide to become a climber and you decide to really go for it, there are avenues for you to sort of live and live decently. Right. That's the only thing that I hope. So right. Mo, right. thanks so much for your Thank time. You. Thank you. Like, thanks. I know this. Thank you. I know the stories don't end, so I might hassle you for another chat of uh, different stories, but for now, <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, super. Cool. See you. Take care.